fixation and saccadic eye movements take place within a field structure generated and controlled by the biological system. Both generation and control would appear to be dependent upon self-organizing criticality, a state booted and awaiting the arrival of data from the environment to realize. Dynamical systems articulate the interface between how the data presents and the path along which the biological system has evolved in order to exploit this, and so establish its ecological niche. These factors build to facilitate core capabilities determining the human unwelt. Our perceptual processing system doesn't map the environment through a series of pictures to provision spatial awareness or orientation. The only factors providing a coherent thread to visual experience are the processes governing fixation and saccadic eye movement made within a perceptually generated field structure. We see the world in relation to ourselves. It's through these processes that we develop our ability to navigate the external world, identifying that perceptual orientation is not commensurate with the type of modelling that drives our current virtual reality and image-making technologies. It's impossible to overemphasize the significance of the self-generating field in the formation of perceptual awareness and hence experiential reality. It must hold the key to the issues of implicit spatial awareness but also to perceptual stability. The field structure and mechanism would underpin multi-sense integration. Without it we wouldn't function. Without implicit spatial awareness and proximity cues we'd be prone in our ecological niche. The implicit data appearing in terms of fleeting comparative values sifted from the incoming sensory system. The perceptual system becoming capable of realising important aspects of the environment by exploiting the physics involved in the delivery of the relevant data, by exploiting our relationship with light. The study of vision as vision reveals that this relationship is not comprehensively reflected in our current technologies or the records they produce. Activity at the retina would appear to exploit aspects of mesoscopic physics that we have still to fully comprehend. We'd need to consider mesoscopic physics to be seeding the two visual pathways with distinct data potentials at the retina, one based on intensity and the other on coherence or phase. To understand how perceptual stability is accomplished, we have to start with what we think constitutes the basis of the system involved in the formation of perceptual structure and then investigate through that working outwards towards the membrane with the external world. We'd also need to acknowledge the metascopic interface between the brain dynamics generating perceptual structure, macro, and the dynamics streaming from the noisy data potentials from our sense organs, micro, towards it. The manifestation of implicit spatial values within phenomenal field would be reliant on a constant flow of input and movement with respect to the environment. If movement were to cease, the spatial values currently presenting could not be captured or frozen in time as a freeze frame and continued to be meaningful to the organism. This particular form of spatial meaning would fail to transpose. An emerging value would have meaning only in relation to a dynamic change of state both locally and in terms of the whole population. These values may not belong to our number system in that they may not be fully discrete. Our current technology is entirely devoid of the field structure and hence implicit spatial values, so it presents stimuli for the visual system that will cause it to operate atypically. Current visual media looks flat and unreal, yet counterintuitively it's referred to as realism. So-called realism is characterised by paintings of everyday life executed in a photographic-like render. This photorealism is then described as naturalistic, Reality, that which we actually experience, is neatly covered off. We are in denial of implicit spatial awareness and the data structures involved. Implicit spatial awareness presents a form of embodied awareness, where spatial values are not related to the detection and subsequent determination of individualised or decontextualised specifics about the environment. They're subconscious or prior to the development of conscious awareness. They are of the environment. So the realisation is that the still life painting is not an attempt to freeze frame reality. It's not related to the taking of a picture using an instrument such as a camera. It records engagement made with the real by a biological system over time. Conversely, 
If the testing environment is still, or compiled from stills, we can expect an atypical response, with the dorsal stream making a diminished contribution. We rely on implicit proximity cues for orientation and to keep us alert and so safe. It follows that when immersed in virtual media, or virtual reality situations, lacking reference to implicit data, the implicit system will largely be at rest. There will be little, if anything, for it to bite on. While this system may engage or monitor the activity being presented, it will not find anything of significance to report, it will not sense encroachment or be able to compute proximity. The embodied self becomes compromised. We must then anticipate implications for repeated long periods of immersion in VR systems, such as neural redundancy and the formation of atypical perceptual structures. Deprivation could lead to permanent damage and mental impairment as the brain starts to consider the implicit system redundant or obsolete, and the relevant pathways break down. What's brought together and made fixed are the two data potentials, the two takes on the real. Fixation is required as part of the generation of reality we engender. It's a primary indicator of subjective presence. And this is a requirement for, and not of, perceptual processing. I think one of the primary preoccupations of the arts is to get beneath the life lived through concepts made about the world, to processes that effortlessly contextualise the world for us and within us. Sagadic eye movement has been studied at some depth. How do these complex processes complete effortlessly amid apparent visual stability at speed on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? Saccadic eye movement can be explored at the experiential level, but the results in terms of paintings are going to be something of a mess. So much adjustment occurs within the phenomenon from one moment to the next, that even when studying a still life, I can't hope to render it all faithfully within a single image. This painting isn't going to work in pictorial terms, but that's actually the point, and this situation need not leave us with a negative. It'll perhaps serve to illustrate just how compromised we are by our current stimuli developed from prevailing third-party ontology and its instrumentation. We need to understand the processes, datasets and structures involved to get to grips with what's actually involved in an act of observation. Having explored perceptual condensation across phenomenal field, we can understand that any changes in fixation are going to be associated with updates to the degree of condensation attributable to all objects appearing within it. The same is true for the disorder values. Overlay and unresolved juxtaposition in the painting attributable to multiple fixations need to be articulated and not artificially resolved to satisfy pictorial convention. I'll revisit each fixation area to draw over the underpainting, marking these adjustments in contextual vision using different colours. So this coloration will obviously not denote perceived colour relating to the environmental setup. In this respect, I guess the painting will become to some extent a diagram. Around each fixation, I've made local spatial references. These show up in the rendering of the tabletop, for example. The collisions between the mismatching spatial renderings are rather nice, I think. Reminds me of the patterning appearing in Paris's cobbled streets, which I also happen to like. You will also encounter mismatches relating to my eye's aperture adaptations to different lighting levels in each of the fixation positions, but that's simple to account for in terms of fundamental optics. For those of you familiar with previous vision space presentations, I'm also choosing not to register the binocular stereo alternation zones situated just outside central vision. This is just to remove one layer of complexity in the hope that doing so will add to the clarity of the points under specific investigation. I am, however, retaining the left and right eye demarcation along the centre line of each fixation, so central perspective convention is compromised. So Vision Space identifies that two independent systems are required for mind to formulate visual awareness, and these must be aligned. This alignment forms fixation. Surely this is why we use the word to describe the activity. We don't just focus upon something out there in the world. We coordinate data structures and their forms of attention around a locus, that relates all the different factors. Imagine the difficulties that would ensue if this function were atypical and failed to set properly. The size of brush mark increases across the planes and curves presented by the objects with respect to their distance from the designated fixation points. The brush marks are also orientated away from the designated fixation points to provide an indication of the radial structure of the field. 
Each mark then holds a dual spatial reference and hence a valid spatial coordinate when seen in relation to others forming in the field. The spatial values appear to form in groups or clusters, but does that appreciation derive from us attending to the depiction and illustrated values using our explicit processing system? Are we reading individual and then grouped values without proper consideration for what they mean in terms of implicit awareness? We should be sensitive to this when considering neuronal receptive fields, the way they overlap, and correlate population firing. I'm not painting leaves and neither is Cezanne. Spatial awareness appears to involve the formation of sets and groupings without recourse to measurement or conceptual understanding relating to line, edge or form. The system simply unfolds and presents. The painted 3D mosaic is actually very anodyne. The actual visual data is noisier. The vision space 3D disorder algorithm is more subtle and can be tuned to be quite unobtrusive and so more naturalistic. While the system provides a relatively weak spatial impact in reproduction, we are highly tuned to this grain and reliant on its function. Fixations are made in terms of subjective perceptual space, i.e. within vision space, and not in terms of the geometry of optical projection, the rectilinear propagation of light rays or central perspective. So an intuitive record consisting of multiple fixations won't add up in terms of mapped environmental space. Spatial awareness is dependent on the navigation of the embodied, condensed, experiential space of the phenomenon. The various branches of the plant belonging to the three individual fixations made on the flower heads would converge at the pot, however they don't arrive in the same place in the overlaid experiential records. In fact the pot has to be referenced in four positions, one for each fixation. The pool pot becomes a floating entity, supplying contextual data in support of the four fixations. So the saccades don't take place in a mapped pictorial geometry related to either central perspective or optical projection. It's not that we somehow manage to perceptually mask multiple changes in terms of pictorial content. There's actually only one constant, the field structure, and we address the world in terms of the way it updates. Why don't we notice all the updating taking place as we make fixations? Because we don't make any pictorial records to track change. There are no frames. When we make a new fixation, what happens? What's the status of awareness during a saccade? What happens to the implicit and explicit takes on the real? To visualize this process, I think it's helpful to acknowledge the protagonists involved. Mind, in control of the attractor, together with implicit and explicit takes on the real. The attention attractor shoots or flips from one place to another within its field. The attractor doesn't move through environmental space, it moves through the condensed perceptual space. This movement within the field may not be directly connected to the processes governing the physical movement of the eyes. Perhaps the attractor draws the eyes. Eye movement operates a subordinate trajectory towards the new position. Lagging behind, it then locates on the attractor's target. All of this suggests that the implicit field attractor typically controls the saccade. We should also note that implicit spatial awareness is in temporal advance of the more conscious explicit form of awareness. The indicators are that implicit awareness evolved before explicit awareness. As we move outwards towards the periphery of phenomenal field, we can determine that condensation is taking place. Perceptual space is compacted at the extremities of contextual or peripheral vision. So moving to a new fixation, located in contextual vision, means moving the attractor through a space that's expanding with the movement. Once again, the real space, as designated by the rectilinear propagation of light, doesn't map onto perceptual space. The flower pot may be the locus for all the various flower stems in the real world, but with respect to perceptual space and the chosen fixations, it doesn't anchor anything. The anchor is the perceptual field, and fixations are a navigation of perceptual space and not real space. The painting is then essentially an experiment to determine the extent to which this sort of complex composite stimuli can resonate with our perceptual system. Is it meaningful? to set a static stimulus reflecting the dynamics of vision.